Welcome to The Journey Home. I'm going to rush us through this introduction tonight because my guest and the topic that we're focusing on tonight is so exciting and has so much for us to cover that there's hardly enough time in this one-hour program. My guest is Thomas Smith. He's presently studying uh, for the priesthood, but he's going to talk about his journey from the Mormon Church, 21 years in the Mormon Church, into the Catholic Church. And so we're going to focus a lot on tonight on the Mormon faith, what it is, how we can protect our children from uh, missionaries and such. We're going to look at all the aspects, and some of the questions, of course, are going to come from you. So remember that you're an important part of this program. If you want to call us with your questions, it's 1-800-221-9460. If you'd like to email us a question, it's at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Tom, welcome to the program. Thank you, Marcus. I could ask the rhetorical question I often ask, could you have dreamed five years ago that you'd be here on Catholic television? You know, I can't think of any greater irony uh, to think that <clears throat> seven, eight years ago I was peddling a bicycle through these same streets in Birmingham as a Mormon missionary, and today I'm studying to be a Catholic priest. <laughs> we serve a God of miracles. And humor. Yes. Great humor. Uh -huh. And uh, let's begin, because like I said, there's so much that we'd love to cover on this program. Let's start, let's share your early Mormon years. Your early Mormon faith, uh, growing up in, where'd you grow up? Southeastern Idaho. Okay. Yeah, I grew up, uh, I'm a seventh generation Mormon. Uh, the community I grew up in was all Mormon. My teachers were Mormons, my neighbors were Mormons. Is and Smith a common Mormon name? <laughs> Smith is very common. Of course, the founder of Mormonism was Joseph Smith, no relation. Uh, so it was very much a part of my life. Mormonism is a culture, and it was everything I was living for my entire life. Um, I, very involved as a young man, of course, in Mormonism, you progress through priesthoods. I was a deacon at age 12, a priest at age 16, of course, different terms. Uh, so it was, it was my whole life, and there's nothing I would have looked forward to more than for the time I could go on a Mormon mission and be married in a Mormon temple. Mm -hmm. But you didn't stay there, did you? Didn't stay. <laughs> what happened? I mean, there you were in the mission work, right? And, and uh, we'll talk more about some of the details of that. But your whole journey was in the Mormon faith. But that's not where you ended up. Yeah. Well, it all built up to my call to become a Mormon missionary two years full-time. I actually came to Alabama yeah. uh, and began spreading the Mormon gospel here. And it was really through my mission uh, that God began to help me see some of the inconsistencies in Mormonism mm. and to meet Christians of real solid faith that caused me to start reconsidering what I had believed all my life. Mm. I had never up until that time really ever doubted my Mormon faith. It was, as I said before, everything I lived for. And then I began to see inconsistencies in scriptures. I would meet, for example, people that would be praying to God when we were in their homes, and when they prayed to Jesus, it was like he was on the couch next to them. Hmm. And I knew I didn't know God in that kind of a way. Hmm. And yet here I was, the elder, supposedly teaching these people about God, and then I knew they knew him in a profound way that I didn't. And so those type of events... Um, caused me to reconsider my faith and why I believed what I did. When you were a Mormon, as a young man, had you ever been approached by a Christian trying to convert you? I had a, a friend in high school that always shared her Christian faith with me, but thought she never got anywhere with it. And she was one of the first people I wanted to find when I became a Christian <laughs> to let her know that you planted seeds in my life that bore fruit, thanks to grace and the Holy Spirit. So there were people early on, but it was mainly my mission that I met just okay. a strong Christian witness. When you're out, uh, peddling is the bad word to use, but you're out really promoting the faith, and then you're, you have to defend it. And as you told me earlier, sadly, so many people you encountered could not defend themselves against what you were teaching. Exactly. Yeah, during the two years I was on my Mormon mission, I was involved in probably three or 400 baptisms and maybe had two times during that entire two years that anyone was able to challenge uh, our position in the Mormon faith. 
because people generally don't know the scriptures very well. And when a Mormon missionary comes to your door and knows 120 scriptures from the Bible, it can be intimidating and convincing to many people that hear it for the first time. Well, it had to take a lot to bring you out of that lifelong culture that you'd been in, trained so well, convinced, and you said it was encountering some Christians. What, what were the specific, specific issues that broke through the... Well, the some area? things were inconsistencies I found in Scripture, but I'll share with you one incident on my mission that was very powerful. We were returning to a couple's home to teach them, and their pastor happened to be at that next visit. He had all this anti-Mormon literature spread out on the table, and we were sure we were going to get in some kind of a Bible bash. But one of the first things they did was ask us what our first names were. And of course, Mormon missionaries always go by Elder Smith, Elder Johnson, and so on. You never share your first name even with one another during the two years you're together. That made a real difference because it kind of leveled the playing field for us. And the rest of the conversation, I was just Tom and my companion was Jason. I wasn't Elder Smith anymore. And that had a real impact. And then each person in the room just went around and shared how Jesus Christ had transformed their life. And it was very powerful. You know, you can argue a scripture verse, but you can't argue what Jesus Christ has done in someone's life. Mm -hmm. And they, then they prayed for our salvation before we left, and I literally was trembling when I left that home. Looking back, I can see how they were able to plant a seed in a very simple way, just by sharing how they encountered Christ in their life. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to pull out all the anti-Mormon literature. But it really profoundly impacted me on my mission. So. Making the move is not easy, though, right? It was a very difficult time for me. Of course, I came from a very small community. Uh, I had pressure from my family when I started to express my doubts back home uh, that I was going to shame my grandmother, that how can you do this, don't be a quitter. So there's a real strong culture uh, uh, that you're dealing with that makes it very, very difficult to leave. And I've met, since I've become a Christian and a Catholic, literally hundreds of Mormons that do not believe the Mormon faith anymore but are so afraid to leave either because their husband or wife threatens to divorce them they might lose all their clientele, for example, if they sell insurance. And so it's a very difficult thing to leave. And so some people choose to just put the doubts in the back of their mind and stay rather than face the, the fear and, and of leaving, especially because you're so conditioned to believe it's either the Mormon church or it's right. nothing. Mm -hmm. And so they really don't believe there's anything but the Mormon church, and so they're afraid to step out into the dark alone. When you did make the jump, what about your calling? Your calling to serve the Lord? Well... It's interesting, when I became a Christian, uh, one of the first things I wanted to do was come back to Alabama where I had been a missionary because I felt a tremendous responsibility for all the people I had led into the Mormon church. And by the grace of God, when I did come back, I was able to help some of those people come back out of Mormonism and find a healthy, well-balanced church. I also felt a call on my life, um, not only to minister to Mormons, but to minister in a pastoral capacity. Mm -hmm and eventually was ordained uh, with an independent Baptist church and, and began uh, a pastoral ministry along with the ministry I started uh, to help Mormons transition out of Mormonism. So there you are, on the journey, Mormon missionary to Baptist minister. You didn't stop there either, did you? No. <laughs> well, what happened? It's a real progression of truth. <laughs> you know, there was a pivotal moment on my mission where in desperation I just fell on my knees and said, God, all I want is the truth. And if the truth is in Mormonism, I'll serve you till my dying day here. But if it's somewhere else, give me the courage to face what that's going to mean for me. Mm -hmm. And when I accepted Christ and became a Christian, I thought that was kind of the end of that journey. But it, in truth, uh, you know, the truth is a person, ultimately. Truth is Jesus Christ. And so the journey wasn't finished, because in the Catholic Church, of course, Jesus is more real than any place else, the real presence of Christ. So it was a continual journey towards the truth. What happened was, I, in my ministry to Mormons, I was trying to uh, use an apologetic that the early church, the church Jesus established, believed in the Trinity, which Mormons deny. And we can talk about that later. So I thought the best way to do that, not only to prove it from Scripture, is why don't I look up the earliest church writings I can find, and from that I could demonstrate that the early church believed in the Trinity and not Mormonism's uh, polytheism. Well, I came to surprising uh, <laughs> finds in the study of the early church fathers, and that was apostolic succession, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the primacy of the Roman bishop, uh, tradition in the church, mm -hmm. and that concept of tradition very early on. And so I was faced with a real dilemma now, uh, studying the church fathers with what I was going to do with all this new information that surfaced. 
And it's interesting to, if we had more time to trace your changes in understanding aspects of the truth through that journey. But apostolic faith, apostolic succession is one of those where it was a very strong perspective on it as a Mormon, a, little, a different one as a Baptist, and then a different one as a Catholic. Sure. Well, of course, as a Mormon, Mormons believe that the early church that Jesus Christ established fell away, fell into complete apostasy, and was gone from the earth probably in the first century, hmm. and had to be restored through Joseph Smith in the 1800s. And I embrace that position for most of my life, of course. As a Protestant, I was taught to understand that the church, of course, was an invisible, could exist in all the different denominations. Yeah. But there's always that kind of uh, thing in the back of your mind, you know, what happened to the church that Jesus Christ established? Yeah. And why are there so many denominations? I couldn't explain that as a Protestant minister. Mm -hmm. And so I was faced with that question again. I worked with a Catholic man who I had tremendous respect for, who later became my sponsor into the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I was always trying to get him to come to the Bible studies I was teaching because he was Catholic, and I assumed <laughs> because of that he didn't know Christ. And here, the next time I'm talking to him, I'm telling him about all these things I'm finding, and can he help me? And of course, he loaded me down with Scott Hahn tapes, and I picked up a couple books and began to really intensely study the claims of the Catholic Church for the first time. It's amazing how many people I encounter that kind of read their way into the Catholic Church. Yeah. It? You can't help uh, but see the truths of the Catholic Church if you study history. Isn't it, in some ways, revision history? that in many ways keeps people away from the Catholic Church? Oh boy, I think so. My understanding of church history was so flawed, especially as a Mormon, mm -hmm. that the early church fell away so quickly and it, was, it had disappeared from the earth. And the evidence really points to just the opposite. The church was alive and vibrant. Even though it struggled with apostasy in the church, certainly we can't deny there was problems and many fell away from the, the church at points in time. But the church was alive, and Jesus did keep his promise that he was going to be with his church always, and he would not leave us orphans. That is such an important promise. Jesus promises the apostles, not only that I will be with you always, but that I'll give you my Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth, help you remember. I mean, that's a promise of the Son of God. Yes. And anyone that says that the church fell away basically says Jesus was a liar, or he had no power, or didn't know anything about the future. I mean, it's a denial of all that Christ is. Yeah, he became the fool of his own parable in Luke, that he <laughs> built something and didn't have the resources to finish it. He began something he couldn't finish. And you know, Joseph Smith makes a very bold claim. He says, to paraphrase him, I will boast in this, that I could do what neither Paul, nor John, nor Peter, nor even Jesus could do. I could hold the church together. And of this I boast, that I can do what no other man on earth has done. Oh, man, it's amazing to imagine the people in his neighborhood, Joseph Smith's neighborhood, following him. And maybe it was so much to cover, maybe we could begin, let's talk a bit about Mormonism and how it got started and, and, uh, and how it has spread around the world. Well, Mormonism really started in 1820 with an alleged vision that Joseph Smith had. After looking at all the many Protestant denominations, he was confused, didn't know which church was true. Joseph Smith retired to a grove of trees, and there he said, God the Father and Jesus Christ, his son, appeared to him and told Joseph Smith not to join any of the churches, for they were all an abomination to God, and all their creeds were abominable to him. And interestingly, and so that was the beginnings of Mormonism. That story didn't really surface till almost 20 years later, and we learned that just about six years after that, Joseph Smith applied to membership in the Methodist Church, and his family joined the Presbyterian Church. But eventually, Joseph Smith uh, had a vision from an angel, Moroni, who told him of buried golden plates, that contained the history of people that lived on this continent, that he was to translate those plates. And so Joseph Smith translated those plates and that became the Book of Mormon. And that was in 1829. In 1830, Joseph Smith founded the Mormon Church, originally called the Church of Christ, and was a very charismatic leader. He drew people around him immediately, some from his family and extended family and friends that were the original members of the church. But in the beginning, Mormonism wasn't as... Um, diametrically opposed to the Christian faith as it is today. It was just another kind of way of looking at things, another division among Protestant sects of his mm -hmm. day. And it has grown itself to be not just one group, but many. Yeah, it's one of the fastest growing churches in the world today. And there's about, I've heard estimations, about 45 splinter churches Groups off of the Mormon right. church already. The Mormon church has about 10 million members now and 60,000 full-time missionaries that are throughout the wor world uh, preaching full-time. Puts us a little bit to shame when we think about our need to go out and share the Catholic faith. 
Exactly. Doesn't it? Well, the, the teachings of the Mormon Church have changed from the beginning, isn't that right, off and on? Exactly. Joseph Smith, for example, in the beginning, believed in the Trinity, it seems, from the book, even the Book of Mormon itself, the introduction talks about that it was here to proclaim Jesus Christ as the eternal God, which Mormons do not believe Jesus Christ as mm -hmm. the eternal God. And throughout the Book of Mormon, you can find references to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being one God. There are some ideas of modalism in it, but eventually Joseph Smith um, changed his theories about God really got involved in some Jewish uh, Kabbalistic teaching of plurality of gods and near the end of his life about 1842 or so Joseph Smith introduced the idea that there's not just one God there's many gods in fact as many gods in the universe as there are sands on the seashore mm -hmm. and that we worship just one of those gods who was once a man and became a god after living according to eternal Mormon principles. Which is to set a model for us. What are some of the distinctives then today of the kind of Mormon theology that some of our audience might encounter in their neighborhoods? I'd probably say the greatest distinction is just simply in the Trinity, which is one of the foundational doctrines, if not the foundational doctrine of our faith, is how we begin our creed. For example, the Catholic Church we know believes that we worship one God who has shown himself to us in three persons. Mormonism believes in three gods. Father is a God, Jesus is a God, the Holy Spirit is a God, and the Father has a physical, tangible body like Jesus. He has that body because he was once a man who lived on a planet somewhere in space and progressed towards becoming a God himself. That God with his many goddess wives produced all the spirit children who later came down and received physical bodies on this earth. And that physical God, the Father, who they call Elohim, had natural sexual relations with Mary to produce Jesus, which is totally against, of course, our Catholic faith. We teach the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So it's a very different doctrine about God. Um, Jesus is only a spirit child of Elohim. He wasn't eternally God. And the Holy Spirit is a, just a personage of spirit. He's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. And eventually he will receive a physical body mm -hmm. himself. So it's a very different view of God. The confusing thing is, when you say God and a Mormon says God, it's easy to think you're talking about the same, same. thing when you're not. What about, uh, I've heard that there's a difference in understanding about heaven and hell. Exactly. Of course, Catholic teaching is there's one heaven and one hell. In Mormonism, there's three different heavens. There's the celestial kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, and the telestial kingdom. There's no such thing as hell in Mormonism. There's a place called outer darkness, where the devil and the angels who followed him will go along with apostates, so that's one of the places I will be. The other three degrees of glory are for different kind of groups of people. The highest kingdom, the celestial kingdom, is where faithful Mormons will go that have been married, and they will progress to becoming gods. The next kingdom is for good people that lived on the earth but never accepted Mormonism. So, for example, our Holy Father would go to the terrestrial kingdom. The telestial kingdom is where murderers, adulterers, people that just lived immoral lives will go. But Joseph Smith said that place is so wonderful we'd commit suicide just to just go there. Mm -hmm. And we would be able to go there taking our own life. Anything else particularly distinctive that sets them apart from... Well, the concept, of course, that they are the only true and living church on the face of the earth and that the, there was a complete and total apostasy and therefore the church had to be restored again in its fullness mm -hmm. and that happened through Joseph Smith. How does Satan and his hordes fit into their equation. Well, it's interesting. Satan is just another one of the spirit children of Elohim. So Jesus and Satan were spiritual brothers along with our brothers in, in a pre-existent life, and we all were kind of on a level playing field. And they, of course, believe the devil is a, a real uh, figure and tempts people and so on. Uh, so it's not that much different from uh, what we believe as Catholics. Now, most of the stuff you just taught, is that the kind of stuff that a missionary would say at the door when they go to meet someone? Well, actually, it's just the opposite, Marcus. Okay. When a mission, missionary teaches people, they teach a very systematic uh, system of lessons that teach very basic principles about the Mormon church. They'll just teach that God loves us, he has a plan for us, he revealed that plan to us through Jesus, and then he does that through prophets down through time, and in our time he called the prophet Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very just kind of simple teaching. As a Mormon missionary, we were told never to tell anyone that we believe we can become gods because no one has the Holy Spirit but Mormons, and therefore they can't understand that deep doctrine without the Holy Spirit. The truth is, if we came to someone's door and said, 
Hi, we're from the Mormon Church. We want to share with you a message about becoming gods. <laughs> uh, most people would shut the door in our face because something checks in our spirit, I think, when we hear that. We know that there's something greater than us, and it's not us. Yeah. Um, and so it's not until you get in the Mormon Church and are baptized and then surrounded by a strong Mormon culture that you begin to learn those things, and it's much easier to accept when you see very intelligent, wonderful, moral, good people around you believing those things, and, and then it just becomes much easier to accept it over time. This whole mission movement is pretty amazing. I mean, it's, it's uh, pervasive around the world. Tell us a little bit about how it got started and, and how it's become so effective. Well, the Mormon Church was only in about uh, eight or nine countries up until the mid-40s, and now I think they're in uh, about 160, 140 right. countries around the world. They have 60,000 full-time missionaries that give two years or a year and a half of their life to preach the Mormon gospel. You work in tense days. For example, we were up at 6.30, we had two hours of study. We were out the door by 9.30. And then we were expected to either be knocking on doors or teaching lessons or following up on referrals. Uh, other than coming back to eat a couple times, we were out until about 9.30 at night. We had about an hour to grab something else to eat, fill out all of our numbers for the day, our quotas that we had to meet for the day, turn those in to our leaders, and then drop into bed practically dead. In fact, in the schedule that I had as a Mormon missionary, there was five minutes from 10.25 to 10.30 to pray. And that was the only time on the entire schedule we ever had to stop and actually have some time to pray. And it was kind of the dream of every young child in the Mormon church to one day become a missionary. Exactly. From the time you're a very small boy, uh, you sing songs about becoming a missionary. You dream about becoming a missionary. You look up to people that have been missionaries before. And so it's, a, it's something you work for your whole life. And, of course, it's self-funded. The church doesn't pay for them. You raise the money yourself and provide for uh, the means of, of going on your two-year mission. What is the underlying motive behind this mission program, this evangelization that drives them? If they're not there to bring people to Christ, what's the goal of the Mormon missionary? Well, Mormon missionary would um, think that he was leading someone to Christ. Of course, since they believe this is the only true Christian church in the world, they believe they're leading people to Christ. But of course, it's to help the Mormon church grow. They believe that they are setting up a visible kingdom on earth and that they're expected to preach the gospel to everyone, no matter where they are or who they are. And so they do that through this intense program of, of missionaries. You've probably seen the commercials on television where you can call an 800 number. That's been uh, remarkable, the amount of converts that's brought to the faith. Because the people that will call that number are generally looking for something. They're spiritually empty and they're searching. And if you, as you've seen, the commercials are very convincing. They're very well done. So many hundreds of thousands of people call those. And I think the statistic is about one in four of those people become Mormons they after call. calling the number. Yeah. And now they're giving away a free King James Bible. Free King James Version of the Bible. This yeah. is very troubling because Mormons believe the Bible is really not trustworthy. It's been changed and altered by evil Catholic priests down through time. And so, of course, you need the Book of Mormon, which they believe is the most correct book on earth. And Joseph Smith actually had his own translation of the Holy Bible, which he completed in 1833, uh, 11 years before he died. But strangely enough, Mormons don't use that version today. They still use the King James Version. Uh, another major aspect of, of a Mormon's life involves genealogies. And I think many of us, if any of us have done any genealogical work, run into Mormon resources. Why is that such an important part of Mormonism? Well, there's three missions of the Mormon church. There's proclaim the gospel, perfect the saints, and redeem the dead. Mormons believe that everyone has to be baptized to enter into heaven, even if those people have already died. And so Mormons will look up all the records of these people who have died, research when they were born, when they died, and so on, and then take those records to Mormon temples where those people are baptized uh, in proxy by someone else uh, so that they can uh, go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of in a holding state after they've died in a spirit prison, and then once that baptism is performed by the, someone on earth for them, then they can enter into paradise. So Mormons have baptized for the dead about 180 million people, and many of them are from our Catholic parish records. They'll ask a priest if they can photograph the parish records. They make those photographic records, put them on microfilm, make them available to us to do our own genealogy, but then they also turn those records into the temples to have the, those ceremonies, Mormon ceremonies, done for those people who have died. Now, where did that idea come from in the development of Mormon theology? Well, there is a, an obscure scripture in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, where Paul speaks of those who baptize for the dead. 
Mormons kind of pulled that out of context and developed a whole doctrine around it. It really developed around uh, some strange ideas of, that Joseph Smith started to develop later in his life. About 1842, he started the whole idea of redeeming the dead in temples. Um, but it was this whole idea that Mormonism has to encompass every person who's ever lived on the earth. Hmm. Why polygamy? How did that become a big thing in the Mormon? Well, world? it's a very touchy subject, and in the last 10, 15 years, we've uncovered a lot more information about how that really started. In fact, Mormon scholars, who many have been excommunicated because of their research excommunicated from the Mormon from the Mormon Church, um, because of what they found out, actually it, it looks appears to have started because Joseph Smith was caught in a relationship with a woman that was not his wife. Hmm. Joseph Smith justified that by saying that God was reinstituting re the idea of polygamy. He believed that it was taught and sanctioned by God in the Old Testament, and therefore God was renewing that, and it was to be a new eternal covenant. Joseph Smith had about 27 wives hmm. uh, before he died. Of course, this was all in secret. In public, Joseph Smith denied any involvement in polygamy, and it really didn't become a public doctrine until the Mormon Church moved to Utah. But he uh, was married to women in their very early teens, young girls. Uh, he would approach their father and say that your daughter is to be my next wife. He even approached men who'd been married to women for 10 or 15 years and said, this woman is no longer your wife, she's now my wife. Of course, the doctrine then got larger, and when the church moved to Utah, it was outside of the United States at the time, the doctrine could really flourish because there was no laws uh, governing polygamy where they were. And men like Heber Kimball uh, in the early church had us up to 60 wives. Mm -hmm. And so it was a way for the church to grow in tremendous numbers as well mm -hmm. uh, because you could create a lot more children that way. And it was an eternal doctrine in the Mormon church that was never supposed to be changed. But when the church was disfranchised by the federal government and their leaders thrown into prison, the church got a rather convenient revelation that <laughs> polygamy was no longer necessary and that was changed in 1890. A couple minutes for the break. What are some ways you, you were a missionary? What are some ways that you could tell us to prepare ourselves to protect our children or others uh, to answer questions when we're confronted by Mormon missionaries? Well, one thing I, I'd want to emphasize is that just because missionaries seem very confident on your doorstep, uh, they, they probably aren't. I was struggling with doubts, and I've met dozens and dozens of missionaries that are struggling with doubts. So reach out to them. The worst thing you can do is say no thank you and shut the door. Please don't do that. Mm -hmm. They need to hear the truth about the Catholic Church, and they need to hear the truth about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to know the scriptures backward and forward. If you can just get your own testimony in a hundred words or less mm -hmm. and just share that with them on the doorstep, how Jesus Christ has transformed your life, how you've encountered Jesus in the sacraments and the teachings of the Catholic Church, if you could just do that, you can plant a seed in that Mormon missionary's heart that that could change their lives. Mm -hmm. And I would say that we just need to teach our children that Catholics are joining the Mormon Church because they're not catechized properly. Uh, hundreds of thousands of converts from Catholicism every year. I would estimate there's about three million converts from Catholicism in, in the Mormon Church today. Mm -hmm. So we really can't be silent about this issue. We have to respond to the claims of Mormonism because it makes a direct claim on the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Super. Excellent. Let's We'll be back just in a moment with some of your questions about uh, the Mormon Church and also about Tom's own journey into the Catholic faith. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest for this evening is Tom Smith. He has been talking to us about his conversion from the Mormon faith and then into the Christian faith in which you became a Baptist uh, preacher and then in time coming to the Catholic faith and now you're training. Training for the priesthood, is that right? Yeah, it's an exciting time. I met Steubenville with four other seminarians from the Archdiocese of Denver in a great uh, pre-theologate pre program of formation at Steubenville. Uh, with about 72 other guys, so it's a tremendous time to prepare for the priesthood there. Oh, you know, I, 
And I've often thought about the fact that God does prepare us for the ministries that he has for us. And mm -hmm. he's put you through an awful lot, uh, but also that gives you some great information to help others grow in their faith. And maybe before we take our first call, we, we ended the first session about preparing um, ourselves and our children uh, to answer the questions when we're confronted. Any other ideas that you could share with us about that? Yeah, one of the things I think that's important to do, especially when you talk to Mormon missionaries or even Mormon friends or family members, is to get them to define the terms. Uh, if we've learned anything in the past couple months about language and politics lately, it's that a word can have many, many different <laughs> meanings. And in Mormonism and Catholicism, it's true. You can say God and a Mormon can say God, but you're using different dictionary definitions of what God is, who God is. When you say salvation and a Mormon says salvation, when you say baptism and a Mormon says baptism, it's very, very different. So get them to define what they mean when they use those terms. And also the Internet is a tremendous resource. There's lots of information for you on the Internet, how to share your faith with Mormons. And it was really the Internet that I found the church fathers mm. in the Catholic faith. That's amazing. The Lord using this great gift that he's given us for the good of the faith. Amen. It's great. Let's take our first caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you from? My name is Peggy and I'm from Portland. Hello, Peggy. What's Hi, your Peggy. question for? Um, I was, um, 18 years ago, I was pregnant and alone and I got sucked into the Mormon church. They got me at a very vulnerable time. And I'm having a trouble now. I broke away from the church five years ago and I'm having trouble finding my way back to religion in general because I kind of feel betrayed. Yeah, you're, what you went through, Peggy, is very, very common. Uh, that feeling that you're, you know, you lived your whole life or something, or even if a few years of your life, and then you find out it's a lie, it's a very troubling thing. And you really start to think, well, maybe nothing is true. Maybe truth is relative. I went through that same kind of a stage. But you've got to trust that Jesus uh, is not that way. You know, Jesus is not going to betray us. Jesus is not going to lie to us. And so uh, I would just encourage you to find a, a healthy church, a, a healthy Catholic parish that you can go to and be surrounded by people that know their faith well and can help you begin to encounter Christ in a positive way. Um, I, I really know what you're going through and I've met so many people that uh, get stuck in that kind of betrayal and that, that, um, that awful feeling that, that you're experiencing right now, but you've got you've to move out of that uh, and, and find... Um, find a parish that you can go to and get, get some more information. It, what she's describing is, is really something I think is happening in, in spades today. And that is that the devil, one way that he pulls people away is to by to give them so many other looks at things that in the end they just doubt everything. Yeah. I mean, there's an example of someone who had a, a seeking, a real honest seeking, and then pulls in another direction pulled back and then doubts the reality of it. And I think remembering this is a spiritual battle that we're in. Prayer is the biggest we weapon that we have in turning and surrendering to Christ. Amen. We know Mormon missionaries specifically seek out people in those points of life that Peggy was in. We used to use newspapers and find out what families had new births, what families had deaths, uh, what people just got married because those people were prime Oh, candidates for Mormonism because they're at a pivotal point in their life where they're very susceptible, where they're thinking about God. They might be profoundly lonely after the death of someone. And, and like Peggy said, you can become very susceptible to becoming part of the Mormon church because they surround you with this wonderful community. Yeah. That's probably also the reason why many go back to the early fathers like you did. You know, when we have so many voices today, where do you go? So you go back and look at the early fathers and it gets you back online. Yeah, you've got to go back to the sources, back to the church that Jesus established and the church that has remained until today. Very good. Let's take our next caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you from? Hi, Michelle from Texas. Hello, Michelle. Michelle. What's your question for us? Well, I was born and raised in Salt Lake City. I joined the Catholic Church and my brother joined the Mormon Church. Uh -huh. He is an adult. He is perfectly happy with his church. Um, we talk religion occasionally, but not a whole lot. How do I plant the seeds that you were talking about with someone who has, as far as I know, no doubt, is perfectly happy with his faith, has no interest in any other, and what are some of the books that you read that helped lead you to the Catholic Church? Thank you very much for those questions. Thanks. One thing that I recommend doing with family members is write letters. Um, it's difficult sometimes to engage Mormons in conversation. Uh, because you're afraid that you're not going to have a good comeback to a question they might raise. And I found with my family, anyway, 
Letter writing is a great way to do that because you have time to think out what you're saying. They can respond in kind. And so when I write a letter to my family, uh, you know, I'll let them know how I'm doing, but then I'll just include something that's meaningful to me in my Catholic faith, just uh, naturally in the letter. For example, I went to Mass, and I'm really so happy that I'm in a church where Jesus is really present in the Eucharist, and talk a little bit about why that's important to me. So little ways you can plant that seed. The other thing is, they may appear to be confident and, and believing in it when they really may not be. In Mormonism, it's real easy to build these walls of, that, hey, I'm doing great, and uh, I believe everything, when it, that may not be the case. Uh, one thing I've also recommended is pray to St. Monica. You know, her son was in every heresy of his day, and yet God turned him around. Um, uh, pray for the intercession of St. Francis de Sales, uh, who brought many, many hundreds of thousands, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people back to the Catholic faith from a heresy. The books that helped me come into the Catholic faith were Surprised by the Truth, uh, 11 or so Protestant ministers and why they came into the faith and it helped me deal with all the struggles I was dealing with what about Mary and so on Sources of Catholic Dogma by Denzinger which shows how the church uh, the doctrines of the church yes. from the earliest days it's a great book uh, Carl Keating's Catholicism and Fundamentalism mm -hmm. was also a great resource so, so those are great books also if you just type the word in Mormons on the internet you can pull up tremendous resources that you can use as springboards for your conversation with your brother. But prayer is very, very powerful because this is a supernatural battle uh, that we're fighting here for the souls of people. And so you've got to intensely pray during this time, especially in front of the Blessed Sacrament and especially the Rosary. You know, I didn't mention it earlier, but I, I think it was posted during the break, but you have a series of tapes that are available through St. Joseph Communication that have your own conversion story, plus you answer question questions about the faith and also give some tips on evangelizing. Right? Yeah, I think the tapes will be very helpful because it not only includes my testimony, but it includes three tapes of just how to evangelize Mormon, different things we can do, different ways we can plant seeds. It's about seven hours of information, so it can oh, be very helpful amazing. to someone. Is her experience common? I mean, here, brought up in St. Salt Lake City, but she became Catholic and well, he became Mormon. Well, praise God she became Catholic well, in amazing. Salt Lake City. That is amazing. Many, many Catholics become Mormons through family situations, through marriages and so on. So it's not uncommon. In fact, many, many Catholics that I've met have Mormons in their family somewhere along the line, and usually through a marriage. It's usually the Catholic that leaves their faith behind and joins the Mormon church. How has your journey been in the relationship to old friends and all of that? Well, it's interesting. When you uh, turn to Christ... Uh, a lot of things change in your life. Of course, I had friends that never spoke to me again after leaving the Mormon church. But you know, God is remarkable. For every friend that yeah. you lose, God raises up a, a hundred new friends. For the family members that are uh, upset with you, God raises up new family. So I haven't struggled with what some people do. Some people are completely isolated from their family when they leave Mormonism and completely shunned. Uh, my family has been... Um, a little bit easier. They, they can deal with it a little bit easier than many. Remembering what our gospel was for yesterday. Christ said didn't come to bring peace. Yes. Division. Because sometimes when we follow Christ, it's going to bring division yes. in our life. That's what, we, that's what we accept in our following of Christ. Let's take our next caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Celia. I'm calling from Texas. Hello, what's your question? Uh, first, uh, you know, I really want to tell you that I really appreciate your show. And because of the um, TV commercials of the Mormons, uh, the way they, you know, they promote the Bible and everything, I thought they were Christians. And now I'm a little confused as to if they're really Christians or what, because of your guest the saying that he became a Christian after Thank leaving. Thank you for your question, because I think that's really some of the confusing thing that comes out of those commercials. Boy, those commercials are very powerful. They're very well done. Of course, the Mormon Church is the largest corporation west of the Mississippi. They have millions of dollars to funnel into public relations. And it is confusing. The commercials are great. They're teaching Christian values. So certainly, Mormons believe and, and live out very strong Christian values. But again, it comes back to defining the terms again. You know, what do you mean when you say you're a Christian? Mm -hmm. The current Mormon prophet just said as recent as a few months ago, uh, very explicitly, that we do not believe in the Christ that Protestants believe in. We do not believe in the traditional Christ. Our Christ is a different Christ. Mm -hmm. So they may use all the same words we use, all the same language, but they mean something very, very different. Uh, and so that's why we need to reach out to them. They're confused. 
and they want to love, they do love God, and they love to serve God. Um, but it's just like Paul said in, in Romans 10, they lack knowledge. They have a zeal for God, but they lack knowledge. And that's why it's so important that we be that missionary to the Mormon. We have another caller, and I think his question, this question will be similar to that one. Hello, what's your name, and where are you calling from? Is that me? Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, I, my question is, um, I noticed there's never any crosses on the Mormon church. Yeah. Um, is it true that they don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins? Uh, that's not true. Mormons do believe that Jesus died on the cross. Their view of salvation is very different from ours, but the reason why they don't have crosses is because they think it's idolatrous. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't have any kind of imagery really in the Mormon church. So if you went into a typical Mormon chapel, you're not going to find crosses, you're not going to find pictures or icons, anything like that. Hmm. Um, Mormons, there will be something up, though, on some of the steeples. Usually, yeah, on Mormon temples, you'll see the angel Moroni, who is the angel that allegedly appeared to Joseph Smith. Uh, but on churches that you'll find in your neighborhoods, you won't find any kind of symbol. Mormons also just look at the cross um, simply as the thing that killed Jesus. And, you know, if, if a car, I used to say this as a Mormon missionary, if a car killed your mother, would you wear a necklace with a car? Uh, on mm -hmm. it around your neck. They really don't understand the power of the yeah. cross. They do believe that Jesus died for our sins, but the cross is foolishness to them. Good. Let's take another caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? This is Mary. Hello, Mary. Yes, it's so good to talk with you. Yeah. I'm such an, adm an admirer of you, uh, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, the Mormons have been collecting family tree information of families, I believe, all over the world. And I don't know the purpose of it, but I was thinking of trying to access some of that information because of my own family background. It's yeah. a little obscure. Yeah. Uh, is that a safe thing to do? And what is their real purpose in doing it? Okay, thank you. Well, as we mentioned earlier, the purpose of it is to baptize all the people in the world that were never Mormon, even though they've already died. I think it's uh, perfectly safe to use all the great resources they have. They have baptized 180 million people that have lived in the past and they have all those records and many, many more uh, at your disposal. Um, of course, they're going to use that as an evangelism opportunity, uh, but you can go to a local Mormon church, for example, and access those records. You can access, I think, some of that on the Internet as well. Uh, just be careful. Uh, use it as an opportunity for you to share your Catholic faith with them, but I would take advantage of it uh, because it is a great uh, resource to have. The question I'm going to ask may seem uh, an obvious one. But how should we as Catholics uh, feel towards Mormon men and women, families around us? Yeah. I always try and make this point right off the bat that I'm not doing this because I'm bitter, uh, because I'm, uh, I hate the Mormons. I love Mormon people. In fact, the reason I'm here tonight is because I love Mormon people, because there are Mormons in my family. I have Mormon friends. And it's because I want to help Mormons experience the joy that I have in my Catholic faith. I want to help Mormons encounter Jesus Christ through the sacraments. So the reason why I, I do all of this is to help Mormons step out of darkness into the light. And so we should love them intensely. Uh, you know, they'll know we're Christians by our love. And when they sense that love that you have for God and that Jesus Christ is in your life and the Holy Spirit is living in your life, uh, that can be a seed planted in them. You know, how can this person love God so intently and they don't even have the truth? That's what it would be in their mind. And it was a real point of conversion for me on my mission, you know. How can there be people of profound Christian faith who don't even have the Holy Spirit? You know, I was thinking about the spirituality of Mormonism. Is there a spirituality? Because I know it seems to me that much of Mormon faith is kind of regimented. Uh, even many of our daytiming techniques, the daytimers and such, all those systems came out of the Mormon church. Uh, is there a spirituality in the life of Mormons? Yeah, the spirituality is generally acted out, though. Of course, Mormons have many, many works that they're required to do. I think a, an early a Mormon apostle um, wrote a book on all the Mormon commandments, and I think there was about 4,000. Well, my goodness, what a burden. I can't hardly keep 10 commandments. Yeah. Uh, I, I struggle with those. So there's a lot of works that a Mormon is expected to do. For example, my brother is in a Mormon bishopric. He's spending 30, 40 hours a week, aside from his regular job, unpaid, in that Mormon bishopric. And that's an expectation on him. Every Mormon has a calling in the Mormon church that takes up several hours of their week. And so uh, it's very involved. And their prayer life is, um, 
uh, is very um, shallow in the sense that prayer life is just a very simple, uh, we address God as Heavenly Father, we thank Him for the things we have, we ask Him for the things we need, and we end in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what's so, so beautiful. So in the service it could sound very Christian. Yes. And that's what's so beautiful about our Catholic tradition is we have contemplative prayer and charismatic prayer and all these beautiful, rich uh, prayers in, in the Catholic Church for all kinds of different people. Mm -hmm. And that was such an attraction for me is to enter into these many different kinds of prayer because my prayer life was, uh, was very narrow, so to speak, mm -hmm. as, a, as a Mormon. And the focus is on what you do. For example, when I talk to my Mormon brother about uh, nuns that are in contemplative prayer for hours all day long, he just thinks that's awful. Yeah. You know, they should be working, you know, <laughs> not praying, because they just don't seem to understand that there's power in prayer, and that prayer is the foundation that keeps our church rolling down through the centuries. So in a sense, your whole spiritual journey was a journey of spirituality, moving from this more works-related all the way to a contemplative exactly. focus. Life. Yeah, understanding the principle of grace was a transforming moment for me, a great unburdening, and that was the great truth that the, the Protestants brought to me. It's just understanding faith. Uh, but but still, my, my faith life was very shallow. I recognized yeah. that it didn't go deeper, and that's what attracted me, uh, again, along with the fathers to the church, is this, the richness of the Catholic Church, all the beautiful symbols and all the wonderful physical ways God has given us to encounter Him mm -hmm. in the sacraments and in the symbols of the church. Well, tell me, you know, what can we learn, though, from the, the Mormon zeal for mission work? Boy, there's a lot to learn. <laughs> if we could get every... Uh, young man in the Catholic Church to give two years of his life to spread the Catholic faith, think what we could do. That's right. <laughs> you know, there's a group called Youth for the Third Millennium that's doing that. They're taking young people, they're training them, they're letting them go, do taking them door to door to share their Catholic faith. And it's really exciting. It's the first time people have ever had Catholics come to their door. <laughs> but that's what we need to be doing. You know, everyone that's looking for Christ isn't always going to walk in the door of a church. Mm -hmm. They're going to be calling that 800 number on television sometimes. And there's hundreds of thousands and millions of people out there with this Christ-shaped void in their heart searching. And uh, it's the people that come to their doors that end up teaching them, uh, unfortunately, the wrong things. And they get sucked into many different types of cults. So we can learn a lot from their, even, uh, uh, their zeal to do missionary work uh, in the church. And I'm seeing more and more of that happening. Young people, especially of my generation, are very zealous. It's the new evangelization. And God it seems to be raising up a generation of young people that are excitingly sharing their faith. Your journey has also been one of coming closer to Jesus. How has becoming a Catholic helped you grow closer to Christ? Uh, it's been tremendous. Uh, the Eucharist is, is uh, indescribable to me, that Jesus Christ loves us so much, he gives us this physical sign of his presence for us. Confession was one of the most powerful things that I ever experienced uh, when I became Catholic, that finally... Uh, I can hear the words of forgiveness spoken. I don't have to pray to God for forgiveness and wonder, am I forgiven? Mm -hmm. But what a beautiful thing that God has given us to let us hear the words of forgiveness spoken over us. And uh, through even the Blessed Mother, I've come to grow in my love for Jesus Christ because she's always pointing me mm -hmm. to Jesus. So it's, it's dropping that line just deeper and deeper um, and making me love uh, my Lord even more intensely than I ever could have imagined earlier in my life. Where was Mary? in your Mormon faith? She was simply the mother of Jesus. Never even thought about her much uh, as a Mormon. Uh, of course, I believe that she was going to become one of God's many wives because she was Jesus' mother. And as a Protestant, I kind of bought the whole kind of uh, ideas about Mary, that, and especially about Catholics, that they worship Mary. But I've consecrated my life to Mary now, and she's my mother. And she's forming me in her womb to be in the image of her son, to be a priest someday. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a wonderful blessing to have uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary in my life. Uh, I don't know what I'd do without her. So. Tom, it's a blessing to get to know you. And our prayers are with you as you... I mean, it's a commitment to go to priesthood. Did, I'm curious, in your own call to priesthood, the issue of celibacy, was that something... At what point in your life did you hear all the calls to go in that direction? Yeah, you know, after I became a Catholic, I really struggled with where's my place now. As many Protestant ministers, as you know, do. They don't yeah. know where to find their place in the church. I, I was sitting in the pulpit, now I'm sitting in the pews, and someone told me, hey, just be Catholic for a few years. Well, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> um, but luckily, I have a tremendous archbishop who I was able to meet, 
and he encouraged me to explore what is that vocation that I had, that, I, that call from God, what does that mean now in the context of the Catholic Church? You know, Psalm 116, the author talks about uh, how God delivered him from darkness and from all these terrible pits, and his response was, then I must lift up the cup of salvation. <laughs> and I can't think of any more adequate response, as inadequate as it is, than to give my life to God as a priest yeah. for the wonderful grace he's given me to lead me out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love that line that begins the daily office. Lord, yes. open thou my lips, and my, my mouth, mouth shall proclaim your, your praise. praise. I mean, everything we have is God's working in our life. Yes. And now our response is proclaiming his praise. Yeah. Our prayers are with you as you go forth the theology. That's going to be a real challenge, right? Yes. But you're going to go forth and, and witness for the church. What a blessing to get to know you, Tom. Thanks for being you, on our program. Thank you for having me. Thanks for your witness. Thank you. Please stay with us. We'll be back in a few moments for some final thoughts for the journey home. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We've had an invigorating discussion tonight with Tom Smith about the Mormon Church and about uh, his own experiences as a missionary and then coming into the Catholic Church and now training to be a priest. So I thought about some of the things we talked about. I thought about ending with this portion of Scripture from Galatians. It's Paul writing. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. It's not just a new problem. Within the first generation, Paul is recognizing that there are already people taking the gospel message and just tilting it a little bit. But through the midst of that, Paul is calling the people, calling the leaders, to hold on to that which they heard from the beginning. We're still called to do that, to hold on to the deposit of faith that Christ delivered to his apostles, whom his apostles taught to their disciples. We call them the early church fathers, as it was protected throughout the centuries by the church. And that's what Jesus promised the apostles, why he would give them the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would protect them, to help them remember what he had taught them and protect their word so they could proclaim it and eventually write it down so that today we have the sacred tradition of the church and the sacred scriptures upon which the foundation upon which we believe. Let's hold tight to that and make sure that we know it well and teach it to our children because there are many voices around us today from every seemingly similar angles close to the teaching of the church but yet trying to pull us away from that which is true. Of course, the foundation is prayer and holding fast to our Lord Jesus Christ and his church, which he has given to us as a family. Thank you for being with me. See you again next week on The Journey Home.